good morning and welcome to the first meeting of the committee in 2015 uh, and a happy new year to you all. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic equipment as they affect the broadcasting system. Some committee members will refer to tablets during the course of the meeting as we provide uh, meeting papers in digital format. Uh, we have apologies today from John Wilson, MSP, and Claire Adamson, MSP. Um, and Stuart Stevenson will be substituting for Claire Adamson, and you're very welcome, sir. Um, agenda item one uh, is to decide whether to take item seven in private. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Uh, agenda item two is to consider the appointment of a European Union reporter. Uh, can I ask that we defer this till the next meeting of the committee? Are we agreed? Thank you. Uh, agenda item three is uh, subordinate legislation, uh, oral evidence taking session on negative instrument, which is the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Scotland Order 2014, SSI 2014-300. Uh, members have a cover paper from the clerk setting out the background to the instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee did, did not draw any issues to our attention in relation to this instrument. A motion to annul this instrument has been lodged by Cameron Buchanan, and we will consider that motion after this oral evidence session. Uh, so can I start by welcoming our witnesses, and they are Alec Neal, Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights, John McNary, Scottish Government Chief Planner, and that should have been McNairney, it's my brief that's wrong, sorry Mr McNairney, uh, David Rickey, Planning Performance Division, and Norman MacLeod, Director of Legal Services in the Scottish Government. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you if you've got any opening remarks about the SSI? Please? Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe just very briefly try and set it in context, the computer, if that's okay, in terms of what we're trying to do. Um, we, we are the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Scotland Amendment Number no. Two Order 2014 introduces an approach which we think strikes an appropriate balance between the needs of rural businesses and protecting Scotland's environment, amenity, and heritage. Following public consultation in 2012, we've listened to industry concerns that the full removal of all permitted development rights for agriculture and forestry hill tracks would be disproportionate at this time. Instead, this order retains existing permitted development rights subject to the introduction of a prior notification and approval process, which allows planning authorities for the first time to intervene where appropriate and proportionately to do so to ensure that the design, siting and appearance of new tracks are acceptable. We have also legislated to ensure there will be no fee for prior notification and approval in relation to agricultural and forestry tracks. So that is the overall setting for this SSI. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Mr Buchanan, do you have any remarks or questions on the SSI? Thank you. Yes. Can I, is this where I can come in right? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, this is the lodging of the motion S4M18842 to annul this. Um, to we'll annul come to that in item four. Oh, I knew I was out of order. Um, Thank so you. So, if you have any questions right. or any remarks at this point, Thank Cameron, you. feel free to do so. No, no. No. Uh, Thank you. Stuart Stevenson has a question. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. I've, I've a couple of questions, uh, convener, if I may. Um, first one is uh, the provision that. Uh, this order brings for prior notification. Is that a provision that is already used elsewhere in the planning system, or is this novel in relation to old tracks? No, I think it's, it's used elsewhere in the planning system. Yes, yes it's, it's already used. For um, buildings, um, agricultural buildings and for forestry buildings, and the, the proposition is to extend that into tracks. That's helpful. So we're not dealing with something that's novel. It's an established procedure Absolutely. that we're applying to, to, to a new area. Um, the second question is uh, one which I don't know if we can answer. And if we can't answer it, that may inform the way we deal with this. Um, and my question is, have we a view of to how many kilometres each year of new hill tracks are actually constructed? Cabinet I, I'm, going to, I'm going to pass that to uh, be probably David, but just before I answer it, can I just give an indication? Because having uh, some uh, forestry ancestry myself, uh, I'm very actually um, keen that we 
get it right in terms of the forestry industry because the forestry industry makes a huge mm. contribution to the Scottish economy and I think really what we're trying to do here overall is get the balance right between ensuring that the we have controlled sustainable development that's done properly but at the same time we don't want to impose unnecessary burdens in the sector that would be crazy because of its enormous contribution to the Scottish economy now in the forestry industry, particularly when you're talking about tracks, sometimes the, the image is of just a road track that's a fairly temporary track, not covering more than a couple of miles in order to facilitate logging and the transport of logs. But in some cases, we're talking about roads, tarmac, for example, down in Dumfriesshire, there's a tarmac road of roughly 20 miles, which is called the A-Link, A-Y, which is a community in Dumfriesshire, and it's called the A-Link Community Road. That's 20 miles of tarmac road. Now, it seems to me it's reasonable, given, you know, that um, it's a very important part of our environment, that appropriate um, and proportionate uh, control should be put on that development um, to make sure that it fits in with our general approach to the rural environment. In terms of the specifics and uh, the numbers, I don't know if David's getting ready to hand, but uh, if we don't, we'll certainly send them to you, but knowing David, he might have them in ready to hand. Mr Reiki? Um, I hate to disappoint the Minister, I don't know the exact number of miles <laughs> that built every year. Um, we have... Um, engage with stakeholders throughout the process and as part of that we've asked several stakeholders for estimates of the amount of tracks that are created. Um, I think the first thing to say is that we're not dealing with necessarily just completely new tracks, it's also extensions to existing tracks. Cairngorms National Park estimated that in their area there are roughly about 800 existing tracks and they reckon that there will be roughly 800 new or extensions in a year. That's just in the Cairngorms National Park area. Forestry Commission have given us figures of between one and two and a half thousand track alterations, extensions, new tracks, etc., being built a year. Thank you. But perhaps I can just take that one further uh, step uh, in, in, in questioning. Um, what is a track? In other words, are we here talking about something that is designed for use by mechanical vehicles as distinct from something that is a walker's track? Just to be absolutely clear uh, what it is that we're dealing with. Okay. Um, right. The, the, the word track does not actually appear in the General Permitted Development Order. It refers to what's called private ways, and private ways are defined as being either a road or a footpath. So we, we are dealing with both... Um, at one extreme footpaths and at the other extreme, as the Minister said, um, roads for HGVs to extract large amounts of timber. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Any other questions from members? No. Thank you very much for that. Um, in which case, can we now move on to Agenda Item 4, which is the debate on the motion to annul the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Scotland Order 2014. SSI 2014-300, on which we have just taken oral evidence. Uh, do any members wish to speak in the debate? Uh, Mr Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much. I hadn't expected to be the first speaker, but I'm delighted to, to, to be so. Um, I, I, I draw on some experience of when I uh, was planning minister, um, and I demitted office from that. Uh, now over four years ago. So the, the, the subject is not one that has arisen in the last uh, few few days, few weeks, few months. Um, and, and it's clearly been one that's engaged quite a wide range of stakeholders. And I'm delighted to see uh, this come forward because it, it, it's not about, of course, our, our seeking to constrain or restrict the proper uh, use of of tracks for a wide range of purposes, forestry, the, the ministers referred to as being one of them, um, but there are of course others and as we've identified uh, it will cover uh, tracks for pedestrians and we shouldn't uh, fail to understand that uh, uh, tracks introduced for pedestrians can have significant impacts on the environment, in particular on some of our more popular hills, um, tracks 
can cause significant erosion just by pedestrians. Uh, so I think this is a very welcome step into understanding the effects on our environment and uh, the benefits also that are derived from the construction of the tracks. Because I think for an area where there are such significant developments and the numbers that were provided, albeit their estimates, uh, were larger than I expected, to be candid about it, uh, but indicate, I think, uh, how important it is that we do understand this. But I think the important thing that I took from my questioning of the Minister was that there is nothing novel in planning terms in the approach that's being proposed. Um, it's one to which agriculture is already subject. They have permitted development rights for agricultural buildings uh, and uh, developments uh, in relation to agriculture and have continued to operate entirely uh, satisfactorily and successfully and while subject to the notification requirement. So I am not at all convinced that there will be any downside to uh, those who make their living in the countryside and depend on these tracks and I am very convinced that there is a significant benefit to our understanding the environmental impacts of this in our having a properly recorded uh, database by prior notification of what's going on. So therefore, um, I will not be supporting the motion to annul today, and I encourage all my colleagues in the committee to take that same position. Convener. Cameron, would you like to speak to what is your motion, yeah. please? Thank you very much. Thank you. My reason for this is because the forestry tracks have been lumped together with high altitude road tracks, and I think it's an unintended consequence of this legislation. This, there is enough legislation already in existence concerning forestry tracks on local authorities who are consulted anyway on all forestry applications. And this just adds extra bureaucracy, which is not the intention of the bill. I think this bill should only cover agriculture, not forestry. Forestry proposals, in any case, have to go through a 28-day period on the public register before being signed off, so there's a due warning. And the Scottish Environment said that forest roads have not been a problem up until now. And I think it's important not to go through a parallel planning process. Also, well, there was a case where we were promised to, that, the, that um, they would share the consultation before, before um, it was consulted, before it went to before it went live. So I think this is an unintended consequence of this legislation and therefore I would seek to have it annulled for that reason. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Does anybody, anyone else wish to enter the debate? No. Minister, uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to uh, respond to the debate? Yeah, the, and, and let me say, Cameron and I had a very useful discussion yesterday and since then I've been doing some work on the points that Cameron has raised legitimately. Um, but can I First of all, just deal with some of the points that Cameron raised. But before I do so, can I say that even if you accepted everything that Cameron said, um, to throw the baby out with the bathwater by annulling this SSI would obviously be completely the wrong thing to do because of the huge consequences of annulling the legislation. In any case, uh, I'm going to go through each of the points that Cameron has legitimately raised and deal with them. The first one was in terms of consultation. Let me first of all make a distinction between the consultation on these regulations that are in the SSI and the consultation on the guidance that flows from the SSI once it's hopefully passed by the committee. Now, in terms of the consultation on the SSI, we have consulted widely with CONFOR and others on the regulations uh, and any commitments made to consultation in that have, I've absolutely checked, have been kept. Furthermore, we have already started the consultation on the guidance and there was a seminar, I think, on the 11th of December which involved CONFOR and others on consultation on the guidance. So the commitments made by Derek Mackay and Paul Wheelhouse on consultation have actually been met. Now, the consultation on the guidance is not yet complete and it's not yet exhausted and there will be other opportunities and we, I will ensure that every organisation with an interest in this matter 
it does have the opportunity to put their input into the guidance. And I'm happy that we produce draft guidance before we finalise the guidance so that people can point out to us any unintended consequences in our draft when we give it to them. So absolutely, totally committed to consultation because I want to get this right. As I said when I started, is getting the balance between ensuring proper control of a rural environment uh, to make ensure, ensure that it is sustainable in the long term, but at the same time, I do not want to impose unnecessary burdens on the industry, nor do I want to impose a planning system that's disproportionate to what we are trying to achieve. And therefore, let me make it absolutely clear that before I approve the guidance, I will require to be satisfied myself that we have given every opportunity, and not just the opportunity to listen, but actually taken into a consideration any substantive points made by CONFOR and indeed others. Can I also say, convener, that there's already a commitment that we will review the implementation of this legislation uh, after 12 months, uh, so that there will be a review from the date of implementation uh, after the initial 12 months, and I've decided that that will be an independent review, so that it wouldn't just be run by the government. I'll appoint somebody independently with the relevant qualifications to review how the legislation is working and being implemented after it's been up and running for 12 months, so that we can quickly learn where anything is going wrong or where there are a, unintended consequences that need to be dealt with. And I give that absolute commitment to the committee. The second point raised by Cameron was in relation to um, the burden and the administrative burden. Let me say that the, there are really already a very substantial process, already very substantial processes in place for foresters in terms of the plans that they have to submit to the Forestry Commission, and therefore the additional uh, requirements for arising from this legislation are fairly, I think, proportionate because already much of the information is already available in the plan submitted by each of them to the Forestry Commission. And we've got an arrangement with the Forestry Commission that they will make all of that information available to the relevant planning authority so that the company doesn't need to duplicate and repeat what they've already done with the Forestry Commission. The only part that would be required to be dealt with additionally would be the addition, any additional information that's required on top of what's already being submitted to the Forestry Commission. Now, an example of that is it may, when, when the companies submit with the Forestry Commission, it's a, a longer-term strategic plan. And obviously, at some point, they may decide they need an additional track or an extended track that's not already in the plan submitted to the Forestry Commission. That would be required to be, obviously, go through this process. But I am very keen, as I've said three or four times this morning, to make absolutely sure, now what with Cameron and with Confort, to make myself, I'm happy to involve myself in this, to make sure that the industry is satisfied, that we're not putting a lot of duplication, a lot of unnecessary burdens on them. And I've already emphasised the officials this morning again, that when we do the guidance and when we implement this legislation, it needs to be proportionate and it needs to be sensible, while at the same time, of course, achieving the objective of balanced development within our rural communities. So we will work with the industry to make sure that there are no unintended consequences. If any arise, we'll deal with them within the 12-month independent review and get it sorted. I hope that the consultation, the quality of the consultation will be such that no unintended consequences will in fact arise. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Cameron, can I ask if you wish to move or withdraw S uh, motion S4M 18842? If you, in view of what the Cabinet Secretary said, I will withdraw it. Thank you very Thank much. You. Are the committee happy that the motion is withdrawn? Yeah. That's unanimously agreed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, if we could uh, break for just a, a couple of minutes.
that now that that motion is withdrawn, the SSI remains in force, uh, and that concludes uh, that item. Uh, and we move on to agenda item five, uh, which is consideration of two negative instruments. They are the town and country planning fees for applications and deemed applications amendment number two regulations 2014, SSI 2014-301, and the charities account Scotland amendment number two regulations 2014 SSI 2014-335. Members have a paper from the clerk setting out the purpose of the instruments. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered these instruments and drew several issues to our attention in relation to SSI 2014-335. These are set out in the cover paper from the clerk. Uh, do members have any comments to make on any of these instruments or the comments from the Delegated Powers Committee? Uh, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, thank, thank you very much, convener. I, I just want to make a brief comment on the um, town and country planning fees for applications and deemed applications order, which is uh, an annual uh, event that comes forward. Um, and it's a subject that I first raised in 2003 um, and continue to take an interest in. And I, I just wonder whether the committee itself might care in some aspect of its future work to consider what I'm about to say. Um, I'm not clear in my mind uh, why centrally we tell local authorities what they should actually be charging for planning fees. Now, I know legalistically why, because the appropriate legislation requires that the government set the fees. But there is nothing in the legislation to stop the government setting the fees as a range from one penny uh, to a million pounds, for the sake of argument. Um, and uh, in, in an environment where we want to ensure that our local authorities have the maximum power to do what they need to and decide is appropriate to do, um, I wonder if in the committee's future work it might be appropriate to include consideration of whether planning fees should be set centrally or local authorities should set them. The more efficient authorities thereby would have a competitive edge, the less efficient authorities would have an incentive to improve. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Um, uh, I welcome your input there. Um, it has been something that has been touched upon previously at committee, and I think that uh, it's something that we should look at the next time we look at, at planning. Um, uh, and I, I would imagine that uh, members would uh, agree that we do that at that appropriate juncture. Um, can we agree not to make any recommendations to the Parliament on either of these instruments? Agreed. Thank you very much. And if we can move on to agenda item six, um, and that is uh, the annual meeting that uh, we hold with the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman and his staff uh, regarding the annual report. Can I welcome uh, Jim Martin, the Ombudsman, uh, Nikki McLean, uh, Director, and Paul McFadden, Head of Complaint Standards uh, from the SPSO, to today's meetings. Uh, members have uh, a fair amount of paper to support them today, and I'm keen that we have a constructive session. The principal purpose uh, for the committee is to consider how the SPSO is performing in the exercise of their remit, uh, an ever-expanding remit, uh, and the extent to which they are managing to fulfil the difficult task set th for them by the legislation. Uh, that is our principal focus, but we're also keer keen to hear the views on how our public services are performing as seen through the eyes of the SPSO, who in many ways will have an insight into their operations through their work. Uh, there may be information that they can share with us which could alert us to good practice in areas or perhaps some difficulties, uh, maybe some caused by the pressures on uh, public services. We also have uh, a number of questions uh, submitted by members of the public uh, and we will no doubt ask a, a number of those today. Uh, those we don't ask we will pass to the SPSO for a, a written response. 
uh, it is perhaps worth mentioning that it is not the role of this committee to act as an appeals body for those who are unhappy with the outcome of their complaint. Uh, the Ombudsman's decisions are final unless a judicial review is taken, and whilst we invite members of the public to submit questions, the purpose of this is to give us a general awareness of their views and to supplement our thinking on corporate matters. Uh, we also need to be mindful that the questions received from the public may not be representative of all those who have used the service, as those satisfied with the service are unlikely to submit a question. Finally, uh, we continue consideration of petition PE1538 at today's meeting, and members are grateful to the SPSO for their comments thereon. Uh, the petitioner has uh, been given sight of these comments and submitted their thoughts thereon. Uh, we may probe the position on that further, although we are aware the SPSO was subject to a review in 2009, during which Section 19 of the Principal Act was considered. Um, would you like to make any brief opening remarks, Mr Martin? No, I think we should probably use the time best by... You're happy uh, for us to batter on, then? Yes. Um, uh, thank you very much. If I can maybe uh, start on, uh, on your expanding <coughs> remit, you're uh, about to, to deal with aspects of the Scottish uh, Welfare uh, Fund in the, in the near future. Um, how are you going to cope with that um, and are extra resources going to be forthcoming uh, to ensure that that additional burden doesn't impact on your current workload? I have been great, greatly heartened by the attitude of the Scottish Government on this, who seem to uh, be very open to the argument that to give us more work will require us to look at more resourcing. And the corporate body is currently discussing with the Scottish Government what form that should take. I think, as you know, convener from your membership of another committee, one of the difficulties we have in planning for this is that we are uncertain about what the volume of work coming with the Scottish Welfare Fund will be. Under the old fund, uh, when it was uh, administered at a UK level, on an annual basis some 6,000 people uh, would take appeals to the, the body then, the IRS. In Scotland last year the number of appeals coming through was less than 200. So we are trying to get to, uh, to the bottom of why that is, whether it is signposting, whether it is our local authorities are doing a better job, which I, I tend to think in a lot of cases is true. But for our purposes, for planning purposes, it makes it very, very difficult indeed to work out whether this is going to be a small addition to the work we do or whether we're going to have to create a, a separate unit. And we're working with the Scottish Government quite closely and with the corporate body to try to work out how we can plan for that but I did indicate to another committee that it would be my view that whatever initial setup we we come to, that that should be reviewed pretty quickly after we have taken on these powers to make sure either that we are resourced well enough to deal with cases which deal with very vulnerable people who need very quick answers to questions, and on the other hand that we're not over-resourced for a demand that's not really there. So I think the planning stages are, are well ahead, Convener, and, and I'm quite content that everyone's approaching this in a very positive manner. Uh, thank you, Mr Martin. Um, in terms of uh, reviews of decisions, we've ha had a number of questions uh, from uh, members of, of, the, of the public <coughs> around about reviews, um, and you've said uh, that you're pleased to report that you've seen a reduction for the first time uh, and requests for reviews of your decisions. Um, also, um, you stated that all customers, complainants and organisations can request a review if they are unhappy with a decision that is not made personally by me, but is delegated to one of our complaints uh, reviewers. Um, there has been a, an indication um, that uh, requests are not necessarily granted in terms of reviews. Have you any comments to make about that, Mr Martin? Yeah, we're very open about um, the process that we go through with complainants when they come to us. As soon as someone comes to us, we inform them of what the process is, which includes the right to seek a review. A review cannot be sought of a report that we lay directly to Parliament. So, and a, a report, which is the decision I would make, 
which would meet the criteria to come to Parliament. Complainants and the body complained about would see a draft report of that and we'd be able to comment on it. The vast bulk of the decisions we take are done through a decision letter and there's a review process available to everyone, be it the body under jurisdiction or the member of public, uh, to bring that. The highest number we've had, I think, per annum, and you know, if I'm wrong, I'll correct this later, I think is 7% of the cases, people seeking review, and currently the number is running at just over 3%. So it's not a terribly high number. Um, in order to have a review carried forward, that is to reopen the case, uh, the criteria for review need to be met. And largely that's around whether new and material evidence can be produced uh, to show that the, the decision was taken without all the appropriate information available. And when that happens, we do open cases, but we, we reopen a very small number, as you would expect, uh, of, of these cases. So we're pretty open about it. The numbers are quite small, uh, and I'm pleased to say that we are now giving people far more information about why we're not reopening cases, contacting them by telephone, and that seems to be helping people understand the process better. Uh, I think it would be very useful if we could uh, actually get the accurate figure. Um, you said about 7%. If, if we could get that, I think that would be extremely um, uh, useful. So I can uh, confirm that now, Kavir. The highest figure we've seen was 7% in the first six months of 2013-14. Do you want to come in, Ms McLean? I was just saying, confirming that we publish all of that data um, on, our, on our website so people can access all of the, st the detailed statistics if they're interested. That's grand. Uh, thank you uh, very much for that. Uh, we have a question uh, around about the time barring uh, for bringing complaints. Um, I wonder if you've, uh, if you've got any comment uh, on that, Mr Martin. The time bar issue is probably one of the most difficult I have to deal with. Um, the legislation is quite clear that um, people should bring a case to me within 12 months of their first knowing about the thing they're complaining about. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to interpret that to allow as many people as possible to bring cases to us. My understanding is that in 2002 and, and in the previous local government ombudsman uh, rules, the intention was not to allow, to allow people to resurrect cases which were years old, where the evidence may no longer be available and where it would be very difficult to, to reopen cases. I have discretion that I apply on the time bar. And, and I've used it, for example, in a, a health case I can think of where um, a family, an incident happened and a family spent an awful long time talking to a health board without reaching a conclusion and then came to, to me and, and it was put to me that the 12-month uh, the time bar would mean that these people would not be able to have their case heard. And I took the view that the system was at fault that by prolonging people's stay within the system, people were being denied the right effectively to come to the, the Ombudsman. So very early on, I made it clear to all the health boards, for example, that I would be taking a view that if the health board looked at a case, then it would be probably, in most cases, suitable to come to the Ombudsman, regardless of the time that it began. But these are the most difficult cases we have to deal with. Whether the time bar should be 12 months, so it should be six months, as I believe it may soon be in Northern Ireland, which I think is far, far too short, or whether it should be two, three years, I think at any point you're going to have to come to the decision, the decision where my successor will have to take the view as to how they use their discretion. So it's one of these very difficult decisions that an ombudsman has to make. You have that discretion? Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you, Kamira. I, I just wonder if the uh, I, 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 Ombudsman has a view that perhaps rather than the time, the clock starting ticking at the beginning of the complaint, the clock in relation to the Ombudsman's activity should start click, clicking once all the procedures with the public body in question have been exhausted. And in, in practice, given that the Ombudsman has discretion, is that the way the, the Ombudsman would, in general terms, look at uh, discharging his responsibilities? I tend to take the view that if 
if a body under jurisdiction has allowed a, a complaint to go into the complaints process, go through the process and be dealt with and a final conclusion arrived at by the body under jurisdiction, that would be a very important factor weighing with me as to whether or not I would use discretion on time bar. I don't think we can lay it down you know, rigidly. I think to, to lay these things down rigidly would be wrong. But I do think that the area of discretion that, we, that I would use would take into account whether or not the body whose decision that I am taking a view on has itself deemed that they can take that complaint. So that, that would be very important. One of the things that we do in our office, which other ombudsman offices in the United Kingdom do not do, is that we start the clock running and all our performance data, etc., from the time we actually make contact with complainants. Most, if not all, of the other ombudsman offices in the United Kingdom start the clock once they have all the paperwork together that they need to begin to investigate it. Now, my view is that it is the citizen whose time we should be measuring and not the ombudsman's time. So similarly, if a citizen has been allowed into the, into the system by a body under jurisdiction, I find it very difficult to see why that should be closed off when they've entered the system if I am the final decision-making body. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Buchanan. Thank, thank you. you. I'm, it's question 17 I was going to ask for. I was very interested to see why you sought help from the Samaritans and also to improve your treatment of the complaint. And what did you learn from them, and has this helped you in any way? It's helped us immensely, and I would advocate to the Parliament and to others, other bodies similar to my own, that this is, a, this is an exceptional way to um, enable people to learn more about how to deal with people who are under great distress and at threat of self-harm. Um, I, I know the question from the member of the public suggests that, that we, 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 we had to do this to improve our treatment of complainants. Uh, that's maybe a pejorative way of putting it. What our staff wanted to know was how best can they help people who come to them in a distressed state. And uh, my team tell me that of all the training that we've laid on for them in the five years I've been ombudsman, that this has been the best training that they have had. And it's the one that's had the biggest impact on how they work day to day. And I can tell you that on two, three, four, five occasions, it has been put to good use where people have been in really, really dire circumstances and where we've been able to assist them to deal with them appropriately and manage to divert them or to, to send them to places where they can get help. So I would recommend this to the Parliament and to other bodies who deal with members of the public who may be distressed. Thank you. Could I also come back on another question, question 19, please, which was how many cases in the year involve corruption or deliberate malpractice? And what, do you have any examples of this? Mr. Martin? Corruption is, is a criminal offence. Well, malpractice is probably yes. to emphasise more. I think, I think behind this question is basically, you know, how often do we see deliberate actions which people take? And I have to, I have to say, I'm quite pleased to say, quite rarely. Uh, on occasion, we have seen some. But if I give you an example, we had one case in, in a health board where, um, in a particularly difficult case, it was suggested that the national guidance on how to deal with a, a particular condition had not been followed because the health board had in place a local protocol. And rather than just accept that, we pressed and pressed until we found out that there was no local protocol involved but that a clinician had signed off that there had been, and the clinician who signed off that there had been was the clinician who was involved in the original complaint. So in that case, I would, I would argue that, that was deliberate malpractice, but I'm very pleased to say we see that very, very rarely. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, question nine um, uh, asks, uh, are the SPSO's service level agreements available to the public? Uh, thus allowing them to judge for themselves if they have received the expected level of service or not. Yeah, Ms McLean? Um, I think that we actually have very few service level agreements in place. The primary le service level agreement we have in place is with the Parliamentary and Health Services Ombudsman to provide 
um, clinical advice to us. Um, there is an SLA in place. Um, obviously, some of it is commercially sensitive, um, and so, but it would be available with um, the relevant redactions if, um, if people were interested in seeing that. Um, but I think that the key issue is can people make a judgment about whether or not they're receiving the service that, um, that they should be um, with that SLA uh, that requires PHSO to provide the clinical advice to us and it's for us then to decide how we use that advice within our decisions. So actually um, in terms of the service that the individuals are receiving, the service is coming from SPSO, it's not coming from PHSO in that sense. I hope that helps answer the question. Um, I, I think that in some regards, in terms of what you have on your website, um, your attempts are to be as transparent as possible. Would it not be uh, a possibility uh, to have that on your website with the necessary redactions to deal with commercial sensitivity? We, we could certainly do that, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr Rowley. Yeah. Um, good morning. Maybe I could pick up just a couple of things, but firstly, in your answer to question 17 about the Samaritans, I mean, do you, that's an interesting point because I know that, that frontline staff and local government or wherever, um, what kind of training do they have, and particularly around areas like mental health and some of the, the issues that, that, that people are experiencing in these difficult times? Do you share best practice? Do you make recommendations around these kind of things? Mr. Martin. Um, I, I think one of the areas of work and one of the most common questions that we get from um, bodies under jurisdiction is around how they can um, work with uh, people where, um, the, not necessarily in the arena of mental health, but in the arena of unacceptable actions where there's a persistent and ongoing relationship and we publish a lot of guidance and advice and we also deliver training to bodies under jurisdiction in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it might be good if we can get some links to have a look at some of that. Question 33, there's a specific question that, that's been submitted around case workers having no medical training yet are tasked to go through medical records in order to submit requests for clinical advice. And I suppose, I mean, if I think from a local government point of view, I know that, that cases that I've seen going to the Ombudsman previously around planning, for example, it could be argued there as well that, that the planners are professioning to themselves that, that, that tend to throw back um, different planning legislation at people um, and, and, and feel they never got an answer. But, so how do you deal with that type of the need to have expertise in all these areas, or do you? We do. And you're right, um, planning officials do throw planning acts at you and, and, until sometimes it can be like a blizzard. Um, the, way, the way that we deal with this, and remember the range that we deal with across the public sector so, so that we have uh, different powers in different areas. In health, we can look at clinical judgment. And so we keep a number of uh, advisors in Scotland. So that I have uh, a nurse advisor a GP advisor, two at the moment. Uh, we have a medical consultant, a psychiatrist, um, a mental health nurse, various others who work with our complaints reviewers on medical cases. We also use a bank of uh, uh, advisors in medical matters, which is kept in London by the PHSO. I've made no secret in the past that I think that the time is coming as the health service goes in different directions in many ways across the United Kingdom. I, I frankly believe we don't have a National Health Service anymore. I believe we have at least four National Health Services in the United Kingdom. That we need to think about having a Scottish-based bank of advisors in health. Uh, I'll give you an example. I mean, the rules on uh, how accident and emergency uh, operate on, on taking people in or not are different in England and Scotland. So we have to be very careful. So we keep these advisors, we keep planning advisors, we have uh, a social work advisor who we use occasionally, we have water advisors, and we've got an advisor on equality and diversity. So that our complaints reviewers will work with these people on the cases as they come through, we'll take the professional advice that, that is given to them. And that's important because, as, as you probably know from your, your own experience in, in local government, 
uh, it can be uh, very difficult when someone simply says to you, do you realise that the Town and Country Planning Act of such and such a date says this? And we find very often that well, we, the advice we'll get is, well, you know, actually it does say that, but it also says, and that then enables us to come to a balanced decision. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Can I ask, how do you uh, ensure um, that uh, the advisors that you're using have no interests in the case that the investigators are dealing with? My nursing advisor, for example, is um, a Lothian advisor. She'll not see Lothian cases. My GP advisor is based, I think, in Milton of Campsie. She will not see Glasgow area cases. So we, we, we try to keep them apart. One of the reasons I think that, that my predecessors used a bank of advisors at the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman in, in London was it was less likely that they would have any links at all to anything in the National Health Service in Scotland. And the argument runs that if Scotland is such a small place, can you possibly get people to take objective decisions? My view is you can. And when I spoke to the, the, the previous medical advisor to the government as to whether or not we should move towards uh, a, a Scottish advisor, Harry Burns warned me that the thing I should be concerned about was not whether they would know the cases, but whether they would have a view themselves about the people, maybe give me too strong a view against the practitioner rather than for the practitioner. So we, we have to be very careful that we make sure that no one has got any conflict of interest when it comes to decision making. And you think you've got that balance right? I think we have. I, I can't think of any cases where I've, I've had any cause to, to take a step back and, and wonder whether or not that was the case. Thank you. Willie Coffey, please. Thanks very much, Convener. I wonder if I could uh, raise some of the issues posed in question 26. It's about to the adoption of quality management system standards, in particular ISO 9001. Um, I have some experience myself in a past job uh, using quality management standards, so it was a wee bit of a surprise that, that the Ombudsman didn't think that the application of the ISO 9001 family was applicable to this, this sense of public service complaints handling and so on. I know ISO 10003 10, might be applic applicable because that deals with complaints that aren't resolved by the organisation itself. So it was firstly to, to, to pick your brain about what your thinking there was, but then of course to, to ask you to follow up and tell me a wee bit about the internal assessment framework, the self-assessment framework well, that you are yeah. developing. Nicky McLean has been doing this in the UK, so... Yeah, I think um, when we originally looked at ISO 9001, I think that there are elements of it that um, relate to um, uh, commercial interactions with customers, which we didn't feel were relevant for public um, services. And so that puts us on a journey of um, considering uh, what we might use internally. Um, I also think that there are elements of work that ombudsman schemes undertake that are unique to that animal, um, and uh, that's reflected in things like the um, principles of, uh, that the um, British and Irish Ombudsman Association adopt for all ombudsman schemes. So we felt that it was important also that we reflected those principles in the quality framework that we use. Um, and so that's why we um, pursued the idea of developing our own um, service standards um, through consultation um, and uh, discussion with other ombudsman schemes with the possibility of developing standards that could be used by all ombudsman schemes and possibly other second-tier complaints handling bodies. Um, so that's the route that we're now on. Um, so we've, we've developed a set of service standards that have been... Um, endorsed by the Ombudsman Association, the British and Irish Ombudsman Association. Um, and we're now um, looking to build a quality framework around those service standards. Those service standards have also been passed our own um, customer sounding board, which um, uh, represents a group of uh, a, a range of advocacy agencies across Scotland. So that we feel that we now have a, a reasonable um, set of service standards that clearly link into and reflect the specific nature of the work that the ombudsman, uh, ombudsman schemes carry out. That's, that's quite encouraging, Convener. Um, do, will the scope of that internal framework that you're developing, will it, will it touch on the numbers of premature 
complaints you, you still you're still getting you were saying it's 37 percent cases are still prematurely presented to you will that assessment framework try to reach out to influence that to, to try to bring that down is which is one of your stated aims what, one of the things that we've been trying over the last two or three years to do is to is to tackle this what we call premature complaints which is effectively people who have got a complaint about a body under our jurisdiction who haven't gone to the body but have come to us before, the, before usually they've gone to the, the, the body. We've done a number of things. One is to look at it in service standards. That's, that's one of the things we're doing. But we're trying to tackle this at source because while it's premature complaints to us, it's missed complaints for the bodies under jurisdiction. And what we're trying to do is to encourage all these bodies to think about, well, why is that? And you'll see in the, in the uh, information that we've sent to you that we went out to uh, 10, 11 organisations which represent the bodies we bring about 40% of the, the business to our office. And we, we identified them using three main criteria. The volume of complaints coming, the volume of upheld complaints, and the number of premature complaints. And we've engaged directly with them to say, well, th this is, these are the numbers we are finding. For example, we had 60% um, of the people who brought a social work complaint to our office came prematurely. 60% is a big number, you know. When I mean, you think that the, the, the number is running about 37%, well, why is that? You would expect that with the new complaint handling procedures that have been brought in, largely designed by, by Paul McFadden here, that that number would fall, and it is beginning to fall. But what we're trying to do is to target where we're getting the highest volumes of prematures, because these are people who are lost in the system. We don't understand the system. And it's sending a message to the bodies that we're taking cases for. You're not getting your message out clearly enough if people aren't coming to you. Um, so that's an area that we're, we're focused on very, very strongly. Those organisations where uh, rather the complaints are coming from, but the people are obviously engaged with certain organisations and they bring to you a complaint prematurely. But do those organisations that people have been working with have any quality management standards, do you think? It seems to me that if we both both sides of the scale here had adopted some kind of management complaints, management standards, you would probably see a further drop in the, the, the complaints prematurely coming to you. I think you and I are, are, are both addicted to the, the same stuff. <laughs> um, I, I, I genuinely believe that people look at the quality of the service they're offering and the quality of the customer inverted commas, contact that they have, then that has to be an element that comes into that, and they have to be looking at quality. And that's one of the things that, that we discuss with people a lot about what we're doing and trying to encourage people to follow that through. But we're dealing with a range of the public sector, remember, and we are the ombudsman. We are not the quality control unit for the public sector in Scotland. And last question, Karina, you know, just at the tail end of the process, when you when you do make recommendations with timescales and so on, will your framework encompass that so that so that you're able to do some follow up and verification and so on? Because it was one of the issues that I always felt as my with my role in the audit committee, that Audit Scotland don't have that ability to do follow up verification to try to make sure that organisations are carrying through recommendations, but you do do that. So will your framework encompass that and allow you to do that much more efficiently? It's, it's part of, actually, as part of our qu current quality assurance process, one of the aspects that we look at is um, how well have we followed up on the recommendations and ensured that the evidence provided by the body is robust and um, meets our criteria. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Mr Martin, you just said that you're not the quality control unit and uh, uh, I, I think that uh, we understand that situation. Um, but do you ensure um, that when you come across best practice that those that are, are carrying out practices which are not quite so good um, are aware of what other bodies are doing um, to, to deal with complaints more effectively so that they don't come to you? Mr McFadden. Yes, I, I think um, sharing best practice is, is, is something that the Complaint Standards Authority work has focused on quite a lot around complaints handling alongside the implementation of the new model complaints handling procedure. And one of the main ways that we have done that is through the development of complaints handlers networks, as we've discussed previously with the committee in previous years. Uh, and I think that is an excellent forum for us to identify um, 
good practice, not just from the particular sector in question. The local authority one is the most established of the networks. We can identify um, good practice from within that sector and, and, and share that. You mentioned the Samaritans training earlier on and how we would help share that kind of focus to frontline um, public service deliveries. And that's actually one thing where we are putting them in touch with the Samaritans and, and giving them our lessons from that training and the things that we've received and, and allowing us to share that across the whole of the sector. So in terms of complaints handling that, so that's one of the main ways that we do do that as well as through the various guidance and, and website forums that we have established over the last three years. Okay, if we, go, if we can go back to social work, because that's obviously one of the areas where you're getting <coughs> complaints very early before you should. Um, I, I, and I think it's one of these... Uh, complex areas where if somebody is complaining, if you're not aware of the of, of the roadmap of, of where you should go to and you're not signposted properly, then inevitably um, these complaints are going to cross your desk before uh, all of, of the due process is, is carried out. Are there particular authorities um, where these early cases are coming from more than others? No, I wouldn't say <coughs> I wouldn't say that you could identify a culprit. You know, I, I don't think so. I think I think the social work area is one which is extremely complex and very difficult for the lay person to work their way through. And I'm pleased that the government is is beginning to look at you know how can we, we streamline that and how can we uh, can we make that easier to manage for people and the kind of what the Paul McFadden has been doing on, on getting simple standardised complaint handling procedures should help that. I think that more bodies could do more to make sure that particularly vulnerable people understand that A, they do have roots and secondly what these roots are and enable them not only to find the roots but to find the advocacy agencies who can help them to articulate their case and navigate their way through the system. I think it's not sufficient to, to assume that every citizen has got the same ability and knowledge to work the system. And, and you know, if we see health boards, local authorities, housing associations, prisons, you know, if we, if we go the extra mile to help people, then we're very quick to pass that good practice on to others. Advocacy, and uh, that's extremely important for, for some folks. Um, in terms of the moves that we have uh, towards the integration of health and social care, which changes the, the landscape um, again, um, is your expertise being called upon to look at how we deal with complaints as we move uh, towards that greater integration of health and social care um, so that we don't create a, a, a minefield for those folks who, who have genuine complaints to make. I'll, uh, if you, I'll let Paul McFadden say something about the, the mechanics of what we're into in a minute, convener. Douglas Sinclair, in the Sinclair report, which came from, if you remember, the Creera uh, report, Douglas Sinclair in 2008 was saying that the difficulties of working your way through social care, social work, um, complaints processes needed to be addressed. <coughs> and I've been saying it since 2009 when I became ombudsman. We have, to, we have to make it easier for people. And when we integrate health and social care and we bring together local authority systems and health board systems and we create new bodies, I've been saying to as many committees as would listen, so I'll say it to this committee as well, we need to make sure that we have a simple process for dealing with things when they go wrong and recognise that the system is there to help vulnerable people. Therefore, it must be a system that is done in that context. I'm pleased to see that there's some progress, but I'm, I'm not yet convinced that we're going to have in place a unified uh, complaint system which will be the same for everybody across Scotland and easy to use. But Paul McFadden's been working on the, on the mechanics of that. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think in terms of your, your question around do we, is our expertise being used, I think we, we offer a service through the, the CSA around providing advice, support and guidance to, to uh, boys across uh, public sectors. And one area where we are increasingly asked for advice is um, in the area of integration and how um, these complaints procedures can be brought together. Because I think despite our uh, raising issues with conflicting statutory processes over the last few years, I think people are now realising when they're beginning to pull together integration schemes that to, 
to fulfil the requirements around publicity or, or, or bringing the complete species together, that these are very difficult to bring together. Indeed, the experience of, of um, NHS Highland and bringing together um, integrated services there is that this does create problems in terms of having a process which is confusing, which is divert through different numbers of stages, time scales and all the rest of it. So we do provide advice where we can around the existing statutory processes, but I think the first thing we see is that this is out with our control, whereas the model CHPs and all other sectors we have had within our control, and we've been able to bring improvements and simplification and streamlining, we aren't able to do this. As, as, as the Ombudsman said, things are moving here, I think, that in terms of social work complaints. I think also in terms of the, the Health Service Patients' Rights Act complaints process, we're in discussions with the government and partners around how that can be brought together and, and, and standardised as much as possible to create a simple process. And that is good, but it is taking time. And it, it, you know, the current estimate, I think, for the social work process to be amended is late in 2016. So there is the issue of the interim between now and then, how we have these varying non-standardised and complex processes being brought together and, 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 and staff as well as customers are struggling to understand that. So basically we provide our expertise as much as we can, but we are restricted with the legislation that's in place. Thank you for that. Obviously, um, we have posed questions, written questions to you on this area and have received responses back al already. One of the things which you stated um, uh, in, in your response is that there may be areas that are covered by new integrated boards that fall out with the SPSO's jurisdiction. Um, that obviously may create difficulties. Um, what are these areas that may fall out with your jurisdiction? We are unclear as to whether the bodies themselves will fall within our jurisdiction. I mean, there are parts of the Scottish Public Services that currently don't. For example, a lot of social work doesn't at the moment. So what we're trying to do is discuss with the government and others how we can make sure that these bodies can be appropriate, or people who have got complaints about these bodies can have these complaints appropriately heard. So it's, it's a pretty, rather than go through individual things, which we'd be happy to give you if, you, if, if you'd like, we, we want to understand what the status of these bodies are vis-à-vis -vis the Ombudsman and for people who have got complaints about these bodies. At the moment, I think bodies are free to set up their, their own complaints processes. And it strikes me that this, this is an opportunity where we, we, you know, we could really bring some clarity to what could otherwise become a very complex system. And uh, I think the simpler we make things, the better. My view is that they are public bodies. They should fall within the ambit of the Public Services Ombudsman. And citizens who have got a problem should be able to raise it with the body themselves and then bring it to us. Um, in terms of your <coughs> uh, discussions uh, with government, have they been positive discussions? You, you talked earlier saying that in terms of the Scottish Welfare Fund, you had a pretty positive experience. Has this been a positive experience with the, with the main, government? <coughs> the main... I'm trying to choose the words carefully here. <laughs> the main issue I have, <coughs> convener, is the length of time it's taking to get decisions on important issues around health and social care integration. And I only look at that, that part of it which could directly fall on my desk. One is, is there a clear and simple and visible complaints process in place when things go wrong for the individual, and do we have something in place for when these new, newly created bodies uh, have got complaints about them? And having discussions with government on them, in, in some ways, I, I know the answer we'd like, but we have to come to an answer soon. You know, we can't keep going on not having an answer to these questions. I think it would be really useful um, for the committee <coughs> Uh, to get further information uh, from you on this particular issue. Uh, obviously, we have got a, a brief outline of, uh, in terms of your previous response, uh, maybe a fuller response where you think the pitfalls um, are, are likely to lie, because um, uh, I think that this is a, a, a matter that we would wish to pursue um, further to ensure that in terms of the integration uh, from the, the start off, we've got... Uh, a pretty robust complaints procedure and folks know uh, what their rights are and, uh, and you know what you have responsibilities for or not. Uh, be grateful for that, uh, Mr Martin. Uh, Anne McTaggart, please. Thanks, Good morning, panel. Um, I had, um, obviously I was listening with interest in your last question that the convener had given to you. Um, 
and I am all for making making this a, the system more simple and and for our lost customers, as you would call them, um, to use that system. So what what are you putting in place? And it may well be a question for Mr. McFadden um, to ensure that our lost customers do get to use this system because ultimately the people that are articulate enough and know the system and able to get through that system will, will do. However, it's for the lost customers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think from a, a general point of view in terms of complaints, I mean, what we've put, helped organisers put in place is a very accessible system, I think, in terms of allowing them to bring complaints into the system in any form, for example, whether that be orally, by telephone, as well as the kind of more traditional written um, form of complaints. And I think the big focus has been in particular on empowering frontline staff to deal with complaints very quickly and, and confidently in response to that. And I think that's a big thing in, in, in allowing people access into the system and making it easier for them to make the complaint as possible and to make the response as quick as possible so that they're not having to trudge through various stages of four and five different appeals of various lengths and months. I think that's something we have now removed in relation to other sectors. I think in relation to the integration area, that's what we want to see in place. I think a single point of entry, a very standard, quick turnaround with a, a, a strong focus on empowering frontline staff to deal with complaints quickly. Thank you. Um, um, one of the questions that have been submitted, I'm moving on to, is question 36. And it's about, um, can the SPSO investigate complaints about HMIE Education Scotland inspection reports? Yeah, yes. Um, my favourite answer to Sunday Post quizzes when I was wee, uh, used to be, we used to have the question and the answer was always sometimes but not always. And I think that's the answer in this case. Depending on who brings the complaint, what the complaint is about, then we can look at some things and not others. So my powers are not complete over all areas. For example, in education, I'm not allowed to look at curriculum or discipline matters, but I can look at policies on bullying and if they've been applied, that kind of stuff. So it's a complicated area. But so the answer is sometimes, but not always. Thank you for that. And my, my last one, um, which is a fairly open question, you have been extremely um, forthright with, with some of your concerns, but what, what area is worrying you the most about moving forward with all the kind of new remit that you will be receiving? If you set aside the new remits, because I'm, I'm, I have to be confident that the corporate body in the Scottish Government will give me the appropriate resourcing to deal with that. When we, when we surveyed our staff this, this year, we had a, an exceptionally good response from our staff. There were only two areas that our staff indicated were a concern to them. Workload and resourcing. We've had a 14% increase in the first six months of this year in the number of cases coming to us. In each of the last five years, we've had an increase in the number of cases coming to us. There are 30% more cases on desks today than there were in 2011. At the 1st of December, there were 647 cases on desks compared to 477 in 2011. My resource base is static. Now, I understand the financial pressures and I understand uh, from the autumn statement that things don't look as if they're going to get much better. But I can't continue to offer the level of service that we are offering to people if the demand increases at the rate it's going and the level of resource I have remains static. My team have given me productivity increases in each of the last four years. We're reaching the point where that cannot be relied on to deliver the kind of quality of service I want to give to the people of Scotland. So my biggest concern at the moment is, in the coming year, will I have sufficient resources to be able to give the high quality service which I believe my team are offering now? And that's my biggest worry. Could I, could I add to that? Um, really, your concern obviously is about uh, the productivity of, of your team. However, what have you put in place to ensure that some of those cases don't come to you and that they are dealt with before getting to your stage, if you know what I mean? 
I think the, the work that Paul McFadden has done with the complaints handling processes will help that because it's, it's going to make the sectors deal with things better. The work we're doing with the, the 10 or 11 bodies we've identified, we're coming with high volume, high uphold, high prematures. They're 40% of my business. If I can reduce that number, then I can reduce the demand coming in. But I think there is a cultural change happening in Scotland where people not only are more willing to complain, but expect to see results from complaints that they bring. And I think, well, that culture, I believe, is a good development for public services in Scotland. I think it's a great development. There are consequences of that for how the system copes with these numbers. And at the very end of that, I'm a tip of an iceberg. At the very end of that, I get the backwash. Uh -huh. How do you think, then, that we can reduce that 40%? I mean, is it the work that... Do you, do you foresee the work that Paul McFadden is doing just now for, that will enable that 40% to be reduced? Some of it, if you take, for example, Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, I always expect to see a high volume of complaints about a body which deals with so many millions of people and so many interactions with the public. I, 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 I expect to see that. Where that health board is doing good work is it's beginning to see how can we reduce the numbers. And so we're working with bodies to try to, to encourage a culture which is about reducing the number of complaints that come. There are good, there's good work being done out there. Scottish Water is reducing the number of complaints that are coming to us year on year. Although I have to say their commercial arm business stream is not doing that at the moment. I'm, ho I'm hopeful for that in the future. So when you attack it from a cultural perspective, where you enable your frontline staff to take decisions quickly, where you enable a quality response to go out to people, not only does that reduce the number of complaints, but it increases the standing of the public services in the eyes of their customers. I think that's very interesting, and I'm sorry to cut across Ms McTaggart here, but you talk about Scottish Water responding extremely well. The business arm, part of the same organisation, not doing so well. Do we have examples in other pub public bodies where sectors within that body are, are dealing with complaints extremely well, and others are not. Um, and are there specific areas um, uh, within either local government um, or, or within the health service where you're finding that kind of situation? To be fair, Convener, Scottish Water and Business Stream are operated as two different businesses within the same conglomeration. So, so, so they are, if you like, the same but separate. Uh, I would <coughs> say that in a lot of cases there are folk who are sitting right next to one another um, in the two different organisations, and why are they not learning from the good practice of the other when they're, when they're in that situation? I think, sorry, Paul, just in one second. I think what we're trying to do is to raise these issues with people. Please, please remember, as I was saying earlier to, to Mr. Coffey, we, we are not the quality control unit for the public services in Scotland. You know, we can flag things up, but it's for the public sector bodies, it's for bodies like COSLA, SOLAS, the National Health Service in Scotland, the Scottish Prison Service, to take these things on and drive them. We can give them the tools, you know, and we can give them the encouragement, but that's about all we can do. I think it's also very useful for us to know where there is the good practice and the bad practice, because obviously it's our duty as well to try and follow up in, in these kind of situations. It, it, would, it would probably be very good for us to get an indication of, of good and bad practice. To I'd be, be honest with you. I'd be quite happy to offer a very brief seminar for the committee from my members of my team, talking you through examples of good practice and bad practice, if you think that would be helpful. I you. think that uh, we would certainly welcome that. Uh, from um, the people who actually deal with the cases rather than the ombudsman. Uh, absolutely. I think that would be extremely useful <coughs> um, uh, for, for the committee. Anne? Yeah, really just to say that it saddens me, obviously, being a Glasgow MSP, um, on the example that you used, and I may well follow that up, but um, if you don't have the answer to this, what improvements, I mean, you used the Glasgow Health Board, what, what have they put in place, and what have you ensured that they have put in place to try and make improvements here? I think, um, I think as part
part of, um, as Jim alluded to earlier, I think his point about Glasgow Health Board is because of the size of it, the board, it is inevitable that you will see high volumes of complaints as compared to other public bodies across Scotland. I think that there are, within um, Glasgow there in particular, I think there are some good examples of work that they're doing around complaints handling. Um, personally, I would say that I, I think some of the things that they're doing are... Um, ahead of other health boards. Um, we talked about quality assurance processes, and I know that that's something that Glasgow Health Board are looking at, at how that they can develop that further and implement. So I think there are examples of, um, of good practice there, and I think there are examples of good practice in other boards. I think that um, Paul and I um, and others look at how we can ensure that we share that learning, how we can create tools we do a lot of training with organisations to try to ensure that you're, you're getting that best practice out there. Um, Paul, I don't know if you want to add to that. I was going to kind of answer a more kind of general level about how do you, 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 what do we put in place and how do we help these bodies improve both the quality of their complaints handling and the responsiveness in terms of improving their service on the back of what they learn from complaints. The health sector aside, I can come to that in a second, but in relation to all the other sectors that we've worked with in relation to the model CHPs and the networks, the key thing that we are aiming towards is more quality, consistent and transparent information on how they handle complaints, both in terms of process, terms of schools, but also in terms of the outcomes, in terms of how, what they have learned, what the trends are and how they are sharing that learning. And we're just kind of getting to that point now with local authorities where they're about to kind of get that information together. Because I think at a sector level, that's what it's going to be of, of, of benefit to share back the, the, the lessons, both in terms of where maybe they can handle complaints better, how they can handle complaints better, but also in terms of how they can improve. That's something... Um, that benchmarking approach, um, putting in place all these kind of building blocks, that's something that we are keen to share into the health service as we now turn in the next year or so to work in more closely with health boards. If I can just add to that, I think it's really important to remember that this is the first year that all local authorities and all health boards have actually published all of their complaints data. And I think actually that is, will be and is a powerful driver for um, pushing up standards because um, they're able to properly benchmark against each other now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Willie Coffey, please. You know, just to ask, um, where do the public take complaints that they may have about the service they get from the ombudsman? Paul? Yeah, we, um, if, I think page 55 of our, our annual report outlines the, the report from our independent external um, complaints reviewer, which it's, it's a non-statutory role, something we put in place in 2007. I think we were ahead of most of the ombudsmen in doing so, actually, because we realised that actually we're, you know, we're, we're, we're the kind of watchmen and someone does need to watch ourselves in terms of how we're looking at that. So we've put in place an external reviewer, which um, we've recently reappointed for a period of three years, um, a, a, a new one we're experiencing across this. So that's where people can go. Uh, once we've dealt with a complaint about their service that they've, they've brought to us, they then have the opportunity to approach that external reviewer. We're quite pleased that, that last year there was a significant reduction in the numbers of complaints that people brought to that reviewer. I think there was a reduction of a third in the, the report of the, the reviewer is in there for the, with the figures, and only eight complaints were taken um, to the reviewer about our organisation, which I think is an indication of, we think, better internal complaints procedures we put in place as, as, you know, as well as better responses to those. So you can not only review cases by request from the public, but the public can access directly the external review body to, yeah, they, they, to look at your decisions? Yes, the external review body will not look at decisions. Um, the external review body will look at service, so there's service delivery around how we have essentially lived up to our own service standards so you know the, the, the very frequent types of complaints would be around for example delay in how we have um, processed the complaints how we've communicated the elements whether we've followed our process whether the person has had a, a good quality service decisions as you rightly point out would go through the, the separate process Jim talked about at the start of the session which is the request for review process which is dealt with ultimately by the ombudsman okay thank you Okay, um, McAllen, please. Just, just taking that up, is it external review? Is that public knowledge? Is that publicised yes, widely? It, yeah. Yes, it's publicised widely on our website. They also have their own information for, for people who are interested in it. And at the end of every complaint response, we put full information on how the person can contact that reviewer. But just to make this completely and utterly clear, that external reviewer does not go back and reinvestigate complaints and review complaints. That's correct. He and doesn't make decisions around about that. The only way that that can be dealt with is by judicial review. My, my other question was going to question question two, but paraphrasing it, what percentage of requests for reviews um, have been rejected? 
in question two, and what is your percentage that have been rejected by you? I think at the very beginning of the session we discussed the, yeah. the number of questions for uh, that come to us for review, and the numbers yes. coming were very, very low, 7%. You said that, First year yeah. from last year, down to 3.4%. Um, I'm just, just going to one second until I find out the number for you. Yes. More. We changed the way that we record the request for review in 2012-13, so we can give you really good comparisons for the last two years. Mm -hmm. So in 2012-13, I received 223 requests for review and all the complaints we caused. And in 2013-14, it was 276. And we maintained the original decision in 96 and 98% of the complaints that we took to the, or the request for review. So the number of um, review requests that we saw um, we revised the original decision in 4% and 2% of, of the review requests that we received. You're looking confused. Uh, only, yes, because 98% were, were, were rejected, effectively. Well, we, yes. There were, of the reviews? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Um, if I can maybe turn uh, to some of the issues which have been generated by Petition 1538. Um, in terms of your response um, uh, in, uh, in about the sharing of information, um, you state that our lawyers have assessed our general approach to the release of information and they have agreed that we are acting in a way compatible with the rules of natural justice. Um, the petitioners obviously uh, have uh, the opposite view um, from that. These issues were, were looked at as recently as 2009, where um, some changes uh, were made. Um, can I ask for your, your, your general uh, comments round about um, that release of information? And is there a danger um, in terms of releasing everything um, that you may not be able to get to the bottom of some complaints because some folk will be wary uh, about giving you the information that you require? I think that's one risk. I think there are a number of risks. But I th and Nicky McLean's the person who's been dealing with this in detail. I wouldn't want to put any barrier in the way of people bringing things to us in confidence. I have to say that you know, up front. Ms. McLean, I think I think what, um, the important starting point is that our powers are actually very similar to other ombudsman schemes, and there's rightly Parliament decided that there were we needed to have strong protections in place around um, what information was um, shared and what information wasn't shared during the course of the investigation. The reality is that um, anything that we rely on in reaching a decision. Is, is released to um, either through the course of the investigation or within the decision. And that's, um, that's the reference to um, natural justice principles. Clearly, we cannot put out any decisions that aren't properly evidenced and supported um, in, um, through the documentation that we release. But I think that your, um, your point is right that there are proper t protections within our legislation to ensure that we don't release information. And you have to remember that we have court of session powers to gather evidence, so we can actually obtain evidence that wouldn't otherwise be um, obtained through FO either FOI or DPA. So we do have an obligation to protect um, the information that is provided to us and take care in how we share that information. And we take that very seriously. I think the issue about the petition is what, what we're doing at, at the moment is fulfilling our statutory obligations in terms of what we can and can't release. Um, I think if there's a, there's a desire or a wish for us to do something else, then it would, would require a, a revisiting of our legislation. Could you give us an indication of some of the um, the information that you would be able to, to gather that you wouldn't be able to gather um, by use of Data Protection Act or the Freedom of Information Act? Yeah, so for example, a prison case, um, quite often we will receive information on a, on a, a complaint 
um, from a prisoner. Um, the, the SPS, the prison service, feel that it's necessary for us to see that background information, but obviously for security reasons we're unable to release it. Okay. Um, obviously, um, uh, we want to ensure that uh, your service is as open and transparent uh, as uh, it possibly can be. Um, if you had any concerns uh, over areas where um, you think it would be of benefit to be able to release further information, but you can't under legislation at this moment, would you call for a further uh, review like the one that was carried out in 2009? If, if I felt that I could not uh, ad administer the office fairly, then I would, yes. And I, I will take legal advice currently uh, if when I think I, I want to be able to re release something, and only if my lawyers tell me that I can't, will I not? That's, and, that's the basic default position, is we will try to give people as much as we possibly can. Uh, how, how often do your lawyers advise you that you shouldn't release information? Well, there's a, a standard um, process that we, that we go through, so it's exceptional cases that that would come up in. Um, and lawyers are also very expensive, so we, we tend to only go to them when we feel we really have to. If we think that the answer is clear, then we don't. Okay. Um, and you say when you think the answer is clear, obviously there has been some testing of that, one would, would imagine. There must be some guidance uh, round about that that you follow. Could you give the committee an indication of what that would be? So within our, um, our guidance for staff, we provide guidance to them about um, how, when, when and how to release information during the course of the investigation. And we could certainly provide that information to the committee if it's interested in seeing uh, that. Uh, uh, you, you, sorry, Mr. Sorry, Martin. sorry. And, and that has been the, the advice that we give to our staff is the, the advice that has been approved by our lawyers. Uh -huh. And it's not something that we've decided. It's, it's uh, absolutely. Our we can do. Uh, absolutely. The, the other point I think that I would make is that if you look at actually the numbers of requests for reviews that we receive, which um, we were discussing earlier, actually the numbers of times that people raise this as an issue. Um, I can only think of one, possibly two cases in the last two years where this has been raised as an issue. My perception is that for the majority of individuals uh, where they have concerns about our decisions that we reach, that we hear about through the request for review, this is not an issue. This is not a common issue that is raised. Um, I, I, for context, I hope that's useful. I think it would be extremely useful for us to get that information, that guidance that staff are given. Um, the guidance that you give to staff, is it publicly available? I believe so, yeah. So if somebody requested a copy of the guidance that you give staff around about these issues, that would be quite easy for a member of the public to, yes, to we, access Yes, we would that. release it, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. There's no reason why not, that I can think of. But okay. if I do think of something, I will come back to you. <laughs> I, I think that's um, extremely useful. Um, colleagues, are there any other questions? Um, obviously, we've asked for uh, a date for uh, written answers uh, for the outstanding questions from members of the public, uh, and we'd be grateful if we could get that for the end of January. Would that be possible? Uh, thank you. Uh, beyond that, obviously, we've asked for a number of of other things uh, from you uh, today uh, and the clerks will be uh, in, in touch with you in, in that regard um, and I'd like to thank you uh, very much for your attendance here today um, and I suspend and we now move into private session.